Hello, and welcome back to Totally Rad Guitars. Uh, I've been missing in action for a while. I've had a very busy uh, couple of months here. I started a new job um, at the end of last year and really picked up steam, um, you know, with things reopening after uh, COVID. Uh, and my job is kind of related to that. So I've been really tied up lately. So apologies for the uh, very long hiatus. Uh, hopefully, um, I won't have a break uh, that long again, I'll be able to uh, continue publishing some more content. Um, so this video uh, is kind of a long time coming, uh, and I, I didn't really know where to start, and uh, and it's because it's uh, a little bit of a complicated uh, subject, uh, and that's Kramer guitars. So anybody who, uh, if you've been to my website or talked to me on forums or messengers or Facebook or whatever. Um, you know that I'm a really big fan of Kramer's. Um, I have a you know a pretty good collection of guitars and amps and things, um, but uh, I have uh, mostly Kramer's. Uh, they comprise the the vast majority of my collection. Um, some of my previous videos about like the Charvels and BC Riches, for example, those are guitars that I had kind of passing through. Um, I did a little video and showcased them and then sold the guitars on. Uh, Kramer's, I have a lot of trouble letting go of them. Um, I don't, I can't really explain it exactly. They're not objectively the best guitars or the worst guitars. Um, and I think what it is is every Kramer is just a little bit different. Uh, and I think that's also why um, one of the uh, sort of frowned upon uh, words in Kramer collector circles is to say something is rare or prototype or, or what have you. And uh, part of the reason is because it's so common for people to say that because there is some truth to that. Um, Kramer's uh, sort of had a turbulent history, uh, especially throughout the 80s. The company was importing parts from a couple of different manufacturers. The bulk majority of the parts came from ESP in Japan. Uh, and then they were finished, painted, whatever, and assembled in the US, and that's the American series. But they're not like a truly, completely American-made guitar. Um, and then they had a couple of uh, lines overseas. There's the Focus series, which is made in Japan by ESP, just finished and everything over there. Um, and then Strikers, Aerostars, um, and a couple of others that uh, I can get into a little later. Um, this particular guitar, and the reason I'm kind of starting off this huge topic, uh, is because this is a 1986 Pacer Imperial. So the Pacer series is kind of the standard uh, model range that comprises most of the Super Strat uh, and the Imperial means you've got two humbuckers. So there's also the Pacer Deluxe which has a pick guard and hum single single. There's the um, Special which just has one humbucker which later became the Beretta uh, and those models have been around all the way back since the first wood neck Kramers which would be um, around 1981. Um, this particular one's from 1986. One way to tell Kramers, or two really easy well, ways to date a Kramer, is the uh, headstock shapes uh, were changed a little bit over the years. So this one, you've got the pointy tip black face and the small logo. That's a pretty dead giveaway that this neck is uh, from around 1986. Um, prior to this, there was the uh, tilt back banana shape. And then there was for a short time a non tilt banana, um, which I have one um, uh, also on a pacer. Uh, so I'll, I'll showcase that one in another video. Uh, and then before that, the beak shape and the strat head um, or lawsuit shape or whatever you want to call that. Basically, it looks like a fender. Um, and then later pointies got the uh, an upgraded uh, or a different logo called the pyramid logo um, where the basically a big K little R kind of descending um, and then they added headstock binding and, and basically everything took this core sort of format this super strat format and they added things to it both in terms of necks and bodies so um, there are a few common features that uh, you know common threads of course uh, but um, but you can usually date things by looking at the features. And one other way you can date them or get a general idea, and uh, like I said, the, the Kramer manufacturing was pretty 
turbulent. They like to try new things, which is a, you know, a big bonus. Um, but at the same time, it makes it kind of a pain for a collector, especially a new collector who, who maybe isn't as experienced with Kramers or hasn't had as much you know, seat time with one. Um, but on the back here, you've got a neck plate with a serial number. Now, uh, one caveat about these serial numbers is they weren't really in order. So you might see, um, you know, you might see two numbers uh, 100 apart, and the earlier one has a later feature or you know something considered to be a later feature but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's a a mutt or a fake or anything that's just you know there were bins of these plates and as they were you know assembling the guitars they just grab a random plate and stick it on there um, so really the best you can guess is maybe within a couple of months or uh, or maybe even within a year um, but you can't really pin down it's not like um, other guitars where you can pin down really really precisely uh, what features are uh, you know accompanied by what serial numbers and so on, um, and that's another reason that makes the uh, Kramers a bit of a uh, a wild topic is a lot of people who maybe have only spent time with one or two or three Kramers, especially after thirty plus years of um, you know lost memories and uh, uh, you know teenage rocking and stuff is uh, people forget a lot of the little details. So there's um, uh, I think w maybe one of the negatives with Kramer guitars uh, now you're getting into collecting them is uh, it's because there's so much chaos in the construction of them and the features um, it seems to attract a lot of people that want to take advantage uh, a lot of BSers and liars and fakers and that sort of thing um, which is really a shame because the instruments are awesome so uh, find yourself a good circle I'm on the Kramer forums there's a pretty good Kramer Facebook group a couple of really knowledgeable people there um, so stick to those kind of groups don't listen to uh, what some random guy you met on Craigslist is telling you because um, most of the time they're trying to take advantage of you and and then another really key resource and uh, there's a few things that probably need updating but it's a great resource is vintagekramer.com a lot of details there um, so this neck plate uh, for 1986 it has starts with an E E serial number um, so very the early wood neck Kramer start with A uh, and then you know A 1000 to some number that's not really nobody can really tell but supposed to be around 10,000 uh, then B 1 through 10,000 that's like 82 83 and then C 1,000 to 10,000 or well you, you could have a number below 1,000 um, and that's like 83 84 D is 84 85 and E is maybe the end of 85 some early E serial number plates still have the banana shaped headstocks instead of the pointy um, and those are really low serial numbers like uh, E below 1000 E um, and, and those are pretty cool but uh, on the rarer side uh, and then the E series actually ran all the way up into the 13,000 numbers before the F plate series was introduced and F starts um, the first anything between like F1000 and F 3,000 to maybe 3,500 is maybe a little suspect um, because those plates uh, I guess got lost or something or uh, I guess we'll never know because it's been so many years but um, those plates weren't really used on production guitars. Uh, production guitars started around F4,000 some and, and then proceeded from there all the way up to F. I have a, a guitar that's F10,000 something. Um, I've seen F11,000 and, uh, and then a switch to the G plates and then the, the company went out of business so uh, and, and that's one other factor is the a lot of changes to the guitars weren't reflected in catalogs or official documents uh, and then the company went out of business and everyone dispersed and ESP wasn't keeping any records at that time either so there's just a lot of um, a lot of misinformation out there about these guitars um, but they're they're very very cool so uh, and, and that's um, another reason why I'm drawn to them as a collector is every one of them is just a little tiny bit different. Um, hence the overuse of the word, you know, rare or, you know, unique or special or whatever. But, the, you know, there is some truth to that. For example, this one, um, this transparent blue finish is not all that common. And then one other feature um, besides the, the cool finish uh, is the early uh, E 
Uh, I have one that's around E2600, E2000 to maybe 4000 or 5000. The back plates are recessed, kind of like a Charvel. There's actually, they're inset into the body. Um, so that's kind of cool. They stopped doing that later, and earlier models don't have that. So that's another way you can identify this body as being from, you know, roughly that serial number range. Um, and then uh, the volute on the back of the neck here, it's, it's kind of subtle. Uh, later ones, it, it gets a little bit more pronounced, a little bit more, uh, more defined. Uh, and later ones, like uh, some of the guitars that I have that are in the F series range with the binding on the headstocks have a very pronounced, um, you know, like edge to the volute back here. Uh, so that's another way you can kind of start to identify. Uh, as far as common features, um, other than very early uh, American Kramers that have the uh, 90 degree tuners, and, uh, and there, there are some, if you see uh, like an unbranded looking, it's a tuner made by Goto, um, but uh, with the 90 degree set screw, um, there are a couple of those. I have one that's E5000 something, and they're totally factory. Um, also some uh, like late C and D plate Berettas have them uh, in black. And then the very early models like A and B plate, um, uh, you know, Strat heads and beaks, a lot of the time, uh, early ones, they have those 90 degree tuners, usually in gold um, or like a brass color. Then in 83, they started using these, um, these Schaller tuners with the uh, 135 degree set screw. Um, and these uh, have a uh, specific, they've got the little Schaller S and they also say made in West Germany on the bottom because um, that was where they were made at the time. Um, and these tuners pretty much run from 83 all the way until the end. So if you're looking at a, uh, at a Kramer guitar and it's got um, some different tuner other than these Schallers, Unless it's one of the, the special cases I just mentioned, um, they may have been swapped out. And a lot of times, um, uh, it's very popular to take these guitars and split them up. You know, take the neck off and put it on something else, and take the body and put a different neck on it, and so on and so forth. So uh, a lot of the originality of these has been sort of destroyed. Um, another thing is, um, unlike a lot of other 80s guitars, uh, these have Seymour Duncan pickups and a, uh, a real German-made Floyd Rose uh, and these nice German Schaller tuners. Um, so they're a little bit, uh, and it's sad to say, but they're more valuable in parts than they are as actual guitars. So a pretty common practice, um, you look on eBay and, and other places, is people buy these. Um, they try to get them as cheap as possible, and then they just disassemble them and sell all the parts. Um, and you know, people that have a, um, a leftover body will buy the neck, or you know, so on and so forth. And uh, because these parts are applicable even in a modern sense, you know, this uh, particular guitar uh, has a Seymour Duncan distortion in the bridge and a Seymourizer II in the neck, which is basically a distortion neck before they were named that. Um, and you, you could buy these pickups and put them in a modern guitar, and they are just as good in a modern guitar as they were in the '80s. Um, people still use Seymour Duncan's, so there's a market for all this stuff. Um, and, and that's part of the reason why they get so, uh, so mangled and, um, you know, sort of uh, mistreated, so to speak. Um, and the, the market's kind of catching up. Collecting Kramers has exploded a lot the last, um, even just the last year or so, but I'd say the last five years especially. Um, I've been collecting them for about... Uh, 12 years now, my uh, second guitar ever was a Kramer, and um, I just always wanted one, and uh, just started picking them up as I as I could afford to. Um, so the the Pacer Imperial, this particular model with the two uh, humbucker pickups, other features um, common to this model, starting from even back when this was uh, originally this was called the Pacer Custom uh, back in the Beak and Strat head headstock days. Um, but then it was renamed Imperial sometime, I think, in 83 or 84. Uh, and then the Pacer Custom is a totally different model in 86 and beyond. Uh, that's a totally different body shape as well. Um, so this one, it's, you know, Strat-shaped. Um, you've got this really tall 
uh, ridge here on the lower horn that leads up to the neck. That's one way that you can tell. Um, another common thing with these is people will buy an American neck and put it on a Focus or a Striker body. Um, the, the screw holes for the Striker don't quite line up, so there's some drilling involved, which is also not great. Um, but you can usually tell an American body because this, this ridge here is very, it reaches up onto the neck a little bit. Um, there's some D-plate Kramers where it doesn't do this. Uh, and earlier Kramers, um, depending on where the body was made, um, but all the ESP bodies are built like this, so that's one way you can tell that this is a, a real uh, American series body. Um, then you've got the um, you've got the three controls here and the three knobs. Now, early ones had volume for the neck, volume for the bridge, and then master tone. Uh, these later ones, it's uh, master volume here, uh, and then tone for neck and bridge, respectively. Um, kind of more standard layout. Uh, and then they use these little three-way mini switches. Um, now, if you ever break this switch, one thing that really sucks about that is um, it's the paddle sort of handle instead of the rounded one. Um, so they're a little bit more expensive and harder to find, especially in this configuration, which is an on-on-on switch as opposed to on-off-on. Um, so if you want to be able to use both pickups at once, um, you've got to get the on-on-on uh, style pickup so or switch. So. That, that's a little bit of a pain, but um, I just treat it very delicately and try not to uh, try not to damage it. Uh, and then, of course, German Floyd Rose, just as gray as they always are, uh, no complaints there. And uh, in this case, uh, since it's a transparent finish, it's a two-piece body. Um, looks like Alder to me, um, but Kramer, like I said, they were always experimenting and changing. So you see, um, you see poplar bodies. Sometimes you see later ones, uh, like Pro Axes, came with mahogany bodies, and I've even seen. Uh, mahogany body focus before, which was really bizarre, but um, there's a lot of weird little one-offs like that. Um, but a, a, a lot of the solid finishes in the later ones are made out of poplar. And what they would do is they would use a, a couple of pieces, sometimes as many as five pieces of poplar, and then they lay this sort of like brown, like um, sort of cover over it, and then finish over that. Um, so they look kind of ugly if you strip the finish off of those. So um, something to keep in mind if you ever get one of these and you want to refinish it, uh, don't expect to get one that's a solid color and refinish it in a transparent color because um, most likely it's going to have a whole bunch of pieces of wood and it's just not going to be very pretty uh, underneath because you, you have to do a lot of work. So if you want to refinish in a transparent color, find one that's already transparent. Um, or in this case, you can see this one's got a lot of damage to it. Um, one nice thing about the Kramer community is there are a couple of pretty serious collectors that uh, are good at this sort of thing. Uh, I'm actually going to send this guitar to a um, friend of mine uh, on the forum, uh, and he's going to keep it. Uh, but he'll be able to repair these. Uh, I've seen some of the work he's done. He's been able to repair these kind of things, uh, make it look a little prettier. And, and um, yeah, so uh, awesome guitar. Um, there's you know, a million things to talk about with these because there's so many little idiosyncrasies. I've got a, a big collection of them, um, and I'll go through and kind of um, try to showcase those, sort of put together a little bit of a, you know, sort of like a collector's guide. Um, but uh, <laughs> enough talk, let's, uh, let's hear how it sounds. I mean, it's, it's not uh, going to be anything totally uh, unexpected. It's got uh, Seymour Duncan pickups, Floyd Rose Bridge, uh, alder body, rosewood, you know, maple fretboard. Um, I'm playing through a Marshall JCM 800 uh, split channel model, uh, 2210, and also through a uh, JCM 800 cab uh, from the same year, 1986, with G12 T75 speakers in them, uh, mic'd with an SM57, um, all just pretty normal stuff, so. <laughs> Thank you. 
Thanks for watching. Uh, tune in for my next video. Uh, I'll try to cover a couple more. I've already gotten a lot of um, requests for some of these amps, um, and I just picked up um, a new orange and uh, a couple of cool Ibanezes as well. Uh, so stay tuned for that, and um, I'll do my best to not leave you all hanging for another uh, three months this time. <laughs> all right. Thanks for watching. Take care. Bye.